Good morning. We hope that everyone will be joining us for marriage night. It's coming up this Friday, so it's going to be a great time just to fellowship in here with our church family, with our spouses. So I encourage you to come to that. If you haven't signed up yet, you can just go to our, our Facebook our Facebook page. It's on there also on our website. Click on the link there and you can get registered for that. So that's coming up this Friday night. I'd love to have y'all come. So good to see so many visitors here with us this morning along with our church body. Uh, so look forward to Sunday mornings as we gather here together. If you're our guest, we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If you'll just text welcome to the number you see there on the screen, we'll get a little more information to you about how you can be part of First Baptist Church and just any questions you might have. Good morning. Let's worship together. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come by his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy. Thank you. 
so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that he should ever believe in him. Here's one that believed in him and trusted in him. And they are about to follow him in believer's baptism. So would you be seated? Good morning again. Um, it's always a special part of our services that we're so excited. And we have the, the opportunity to, to come before everyone with baptism. And what a proclamation that it is. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, how do you go about uh, being baptized? Or, you know, you don't really have an altar call here. How, how do you go about um, talking to a, a minister about a decision that you want to make? Uh, we'd love to visit with you in the week. You're always welcome to call. Also, following each service, um, over here to this side here, there's a room where we have some people that would love to visit with you following the services. And, and a few Sundays back, I had Aubrey Birch came and said, Jason, I would love to visit with you about um, what it means to be baptized and follow after Christ. And, oh, man, just made my heart melt. And just we just had the best conversation. Um, Aubrey, do you have some family that's come here today? Some family out there, you want to give us a, a big wave? I think they've come from, from out of town here and just makes the day all the more special. And um, this is just such an exciting day for you, Aubrey, and as a church body, we come along and celebrate with you. So if we have Aubrey Birch here today, I want to ask you, Aubrey, one most important question. Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? It's because of the, that proclamation that it's my joy to baptize you as my sister in Christ name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. For we've been buried with Christ through baptism into death and raised to walk in a new way of life. Again, if anybody else would want to come and, and, and test out these waters, we'd love to talk to you about that following the service. Um, let's continue on in worship. It's, it's very correct. We, 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 we want to follow in worship and we want to follow in praise because it's the, 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 God's word says he inhabits. He makes his home in the praises of his people. And it's in praise, it's in praise that we find God is the sustainer. It's in praise that we find God is the deliverer and God is the healer. And for whatever you, your needs is as you enter into praise, we're, we pray that that today we wouldn't just come to church, but that we would experience life change here through our worship. Our understanding that we are the church, that, that, that the calling on our heart, the calling in our lives is to, is to uh, be different and to, to be changed uh, a little at a time as he molds us and he makes us into the image of his son. I want to pray for us and I want our worship to honor him, I want, to, I want you to sing. I want you to, to sing out uh, from the bottom of your lungs to uh, in your heart in, in worship. So would you bow with me as we pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us. Lord, thank you for setting us aside. God, I thank you that you allow us this privilege of worship to be even, even able to, to utter your, your name. God, you are the God of the universe. You're the creator of it all. God, you want to have a relationship with us. God, how can we not? How can we not celebrate? How can we not praise and sing? God, I pray that that would be today. Lord, if those who come today might uh, discover in, through worship and through praise, and through your word, God, that, that you are the healer and you're the, you're the sustainer, you're the provider, you're the victor, you're the warrior. You're all those things and more. God, we love you and we thank you and we worship you this day in your name, your holy name. Amen.
air of heaven where pain is gone and mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity there will be a
Well, amen, church. It's good to be in the Lord's house. And don't you just enjoy that time of worship together? Amen. You know, singing songs of praise, not only are we glorifying the Lord, but I think it's a moment where, where God kind of just tills the ground in our hearts to receive his word. And so this morning, we are beginning a new journey, a bit of an exploration, really, through the book of Ephesians. And I'll be honest with you, I love this letter to the Ephesians. It is, it is rich, and I hope we continue to grow in the Lord as we explore all the many chapters and verses in the book of Ephesians. But this morning, let me begin by asking you a question. If you had $2 billion, now we, we could have went with a lesser number, but I thought if we're going to dream, we might as well dream big, amen? So if you had $2 billion, would you eat sandwiches three times a day? Um, the answer to that is no. If I had $2 billion, it would not be sandwiches. It would be fried shrimp, filet mignon, and sushi rolls every meal. No Vienna sausages, no spam, no beans and rice, rice and beans, beans and rice, none of that. It would be daily deliciousness. Can I get an amen? amen? There you go. Money wouldn't be a limiting factor. I've got $2 billion in the bank. I'm eating what I want to eat. Now, would you believe, this is interesting to me, because I've read stories where people have died of malnutrition with a fortune sitting in their bank accounts. It's mind-blowing to me. There, in fact, in the early 1900s, there was a woman, a millionaire, probably actually a billionaire for that time, by the name of Hetty Green. And Hetty Green, um, her son had a leg injury, and instead of just taking him to the doctor and forking out the cash because she had plenty of it, she tried to find a free clinic because she didn't want to part loose with any of that money that she had. And her son ended up having his leg amputated because she didn't want to dip into her financial reserves. Now, I tell you that to tell you this. It's, it's this type of person that Paul was writing to in the book of Ephesians. Christians who have access to unlimited wealth in Christ, but live as though they are spiritually poor. In other words, Ephesians is written to believers who are not fully enjoying the richness, the abundant richness of Christ. And so this is what I want you to know this morning, friends. We have an incredible inheritance as believers. And as we work through this, this book for the next weeks and months, I want that to really absorb down into our hearts and minds that we are rich in Christ. No more sandwiches. We have abundant richness in our Heavenly Father. And so God has paid every debt we have incurred. Now think about that. Every sin you've ever committed, everything that you have shame or guilt for was nailed to the cross of Calvary and we bear it no more. The Bible says every sin we have ever committed is washed away. Because in, in the economy of God's grace and mercy, there is nothing he can't afford. We are rich in Christ. Now, Scripture does tell us there's one sin that is unto death, one sin that cannot be forgiven. And that's denying Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Saying, you know what, I, I hear your offer for salvation, but I'm going to say no thank you. Um, why one would do that is, is hard to imagine, but we live in a world that is full of darkness and the world is blinded. But this morning, as we get into Ephesians, we're going to see that we are so incredibly blessed, so incredibly wealthy. So before we dive into the book, I want to do a little background information because I believe this. I believe when we open God's Word, we should do our best to understand it in its context, um, to kind of know what's going on, to get a little bit of background information, because God has entrusted us with this amazing collection of writings, 66 books that all flow together, written by over 40 authors over the span of 1,500 years, and it all works together. I think we should give our most diligent effort to understand what it says. And so let's look at some background information, starting off with the author, dead giveaway, Ephesians 1, verse 1. It begins with a greeting, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. And so that lets us know who it was written by. The apostle Paul, not a lot of dispute there, but what is an apostle? Well, an apostle means sent one. And so the Apostle Paul and many of the other apostles laid the foundation for the early church, wrote the New Testament. But Paul himself was a highly educated man, a Jew, in fact, by the name of Saul. That was his Jewish name. And so Saul hated 
Christianity. He wanted to snuff it out. In fact, it wasn't called Christianity at the time. It was known as the way. And don't you just love that? The way. Why did they call them the way? Why did they call believers the way? Because just like Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was the way to God. And so Paul was on a vendetta to snuff out, to wipe out the way when he met Christ on the road to Damascus. His life was turned around. And so Paul, upwardly mobile, wealthy individual, fame, it was, it was accumulating, but all that changes in the life of Paul as he's chosen by Christ for a specific task. And so that leads us to the, the letter, the epistle itself, um, written by Paul, as we've said, around the year of 60 to 62, but written from prison. It's one of the prison epistles, epistles, one of the four letters that Paul would write from prison. And I think we sort of have to juxtapose these images in our mind, that Paul, wealthy, moving up the ranks, humbled, writing a letter from prison, but in prison, wealthy, as he experienced this Christian inheritance that he received in Christ. And so the church in Ephesus was established by Paul, in fact, and this letter to the Ephesians was most likely meant to circulate around all the churches in Asia Minor at that time. If you read the book of Revelation, um, you see that, that John wrote his letter to these seven churches in Asia Minor. And so we've seen that it was written by Paul around 60 to 62 uh, to the, the church at Ephesus, but the, the book of Ephesians is laid out like this. The first three chapters are deeply theological, and the, uh, the last three chapters are practical. And so we're going to wade together through some deeper thinking as Paul starts these first three chapters, and that's going to flow into some practical living. Now, this is what I think, because I talk to Christians sometimes, believe it or not, and sometimes in conversations I hear this, I don't need no theology I just want to live a practical life and be happy and, and just serve the Lord. And, and I want to do that too, but here's what I think. I think living a practical life flows from having a good theology. And so Paul instructs us theologically, and then he kind of shows how that shapes and how that kind of molds our life. Theology is the study of God. So as we study God and we understand who God is and we understand who we are, it informs the way that we live on a daily basis. And so let's look together at this, this church, this assembly in Ephesus, those that received this letter. Back to verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul addresses the letter to the saints in Ephesus. Interestingly, he'll use that word saint nine times throughout the rest of this letter. So I think we should ask, what is a saint? Well, Catholic doctrine teaches that, you know, saints are, are revered and there's, there's certain steps you have to go through to, to attain sainthood. Well, that's not what Paul's saying. Paul is using the word saint simply to mean if you are in Christ, if you have placed your trust in him, you're a saint. And so I know this morning we have many saints with us. So this morning, if you know the Lord, say, I'm a saint. Now, your spouse may not agree with that statement. But if you're in Christ, you are, in fact, a saint. And so we know that this book, this letter, is written to believers. It's written to Christians in the, in the church at Ephesus. But Paul says, grace to you and peace from God. Now, this was a common greeting in the New Testament, but it's much more than just a nicety here. Uh, you know, he says, grace to you and peace from God. Well, what is grace? Well, it's God's undeserved favor. It's part of our inheritance in Christ. It shows us his kindness, that he loves us, even though we didn't deserve it, even though we were dead and lost in our sins, that Christ gives us grace, undeserved kindness. Without grace, you can have no peace. Without grace, we can't be at peace with God, and we can't have the peace of God until we experience Christ's grace. Verse 2. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So where does this grace come from? Paul reminds us, how do we have this peace? Well, it all flows from our God, Jesus Christ. Now, you see, we're two verses in, and already we're seeing this theme building of richness, of inheritance. And so as we, as we continue, let's talk about that theme. Verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly 
places. Now, as we read Ephesians, we're going to talk about a lot of different topics. We're going to get into spiritual warfare, you know, that famous passage, put on the full armor of God. We're going to talk about the body of Christ, where Paul uses those analogies and says, you know, every port, part of the body is important. We're going to talk about wisdom and what it means to walk in wisdom. Paul even addresses marriage a bit in Ephesians. But this theme that you'll see continue to pop up is the inheritance that we have in Christ, that we are rich, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So Christian, if you're not excited this morning, maybe you come this morning and it's just been a rough week or a rough weekend or it's been a, you know, just a difficult time. I understand that. We live in a fallen world and things don't go like we want them to. We experience sin and sorrow and death. But can I just encourage you this morning and remind you that you have this inheritance and that you're not just rich. You are filthy, stinking rich through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we live in a culture where man is the measure of all things. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. And so people are constantly trying to find identity and purpose and self-worth and value and meaning. In fact, in 2019, nearly 19 million self-help books were sold. Now, that's a lot of self-help books. Now, we, we must ask the question, why is that? Well, because people are searching to find meaning and purpose, and value, and identity, and self-esteem. But very few self-help books point to God or His Word, so man is brought back to himself to find answers to life's biggest questions. And the problem with that is man can't answer those questions in a long-term, meaningful way. Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Do I matter? Can I know right from wrong? What is my true identity? The only way we can get answers and make sense of life is in Christ. Do you see it? Do you see how rich we are as Christians to have something that defines all of life for us? Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So Paul says, blessed be God the Father. Remember, we've talked about everything exists for his glory. But also, because he has blessed us. So who's the blessed one? God is. Who blesses us? God does. Who gives us an inheritance? God. Who has sent us Christ? God. Who is blessed? We are. We have such a great inheritance in Christ. He's withheld nothing from us. So if you're following along, we'll move to point two, and it's simply this, that that you're rich, that you are incredibly, incredibly rich. I'll tell you a story. One year, several years ago, we took our kids uh, trick-or-treating with some friends in in Lumberton, and the, the addition that we were in is that my kids would go to the door with their, with their bag. They wouldn't give those little fun size candy bars. They would give a whole full-size candy bar. And my philosophy is there's nothing fun about a bite of a candy bar. <laughs> fun size, I don't know who, what marketing campaign did that. We want, we want the real deal. So my kids, as they're trick-or-treating, every house they got a full-size candy bar. And so they come home, and each kid has like 50 full-size candy bars. And after they paid the dad tax... They had about 45 each, and they, they're looking at this, this bounty of chocolatey, caramelly goodness, and they're like, we are rich. Look at all of this stash of candy that we have. Now, what my kids didn't realize was over the years, I've probably bought them hundreds, if not a thousand, candy bars. They didn't realize that they were, they, they've been rich all along. But when you have 45 candy bars in your hands, you you think, you know what, I'm kind of a big deal, right? They were excited. But Christian, I want you to think about as we journey together, I want you to contemplate. I want this to funnel down into your hearts and minds, to examine, be reminded, you are so rich that you have this incredible, incredible inheritance. And so in this chapter, Paul shows us that the Father, that the Son, and that the Spirit have lavished us with so many riches. And so today we brush up against this doctrine uh, known as the doctrine of the Trinity that God is unique, that he's like us, or I should rather say we are like God in many ways because we've been made in his image. 
But God is different than we are. He is, he is altogether other. And that God is, you know, one being, one essence that exists in three persons. So he's one what? He's one God, three who's, three persons. And, you know, that makes us scratch our head a little bit because it's different than you and I. But also think about this. It reminds us of this, that God lacks nothing. That in eternity past, God wasn't lonely because he had complete and perfect fellowship within the Godhead between Father and Son and Spirit. And sometimes people will say, well, that's why God made people, so he had some friends to hang out with. No, 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 no. God was completely content and fine within himself, Father, Spirit, and Son. But what Paul does is he sort of breaks down these three persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Spirit, and he shows us that we are rich abundantly through all members of the Trinity. And so to start off with this morning, we're going to notice as Paul is walking us through this, he's directing us, we're going to notice riches from the Father. And I want to pick up the pace a little bit because the time is clipping away. You know, they say time flies when you're having fun, at least for me anyway. So Ephesians, riches from the Father, look at verse 4. It says, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now, this verse has been the cause of much consternation and debate. People have interpreted it in different ways. Um, sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. But I want you to notice the beauty and the richness here in this verse, that God the Father chose us. God could have chosen to create many different worlds with many different people, and some of those worlds might not have included me. That could have not included you. But God chose to make this world that he made, and he knew you'd be here, and he knew I would be here, and God said, let's do it. And God, knowing that, I want you to be reminded that God loves each of us so very, very much. But God also knew, even before he created the world, that man would fall into sin. It's not like God has a plan A, oh, that didn't work out, that's jumped to plan B. No, no, God knew everything that was going to happen. He had a plan. And so, is this verse saying that God chose some to be Christians and others? He said, no, nah, I'm not going to choose you. I don't think so because I see all throughout the Bible that God desires that all men should be saved and come to repentance and come to a knowledge of the Lord. God chose us and that he promised and had a plan to redeem mankind. God calls all those who reject his call to salvation um, will, will not inherit these promises to be blameless and holy before him. So verse 4 and 5, let's read them. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now again, that word predestined, we get hung up on that sometimes. And again, some think, well, God determined some to be saved and determined some wouldn't be saved. But you're not saved by being adopted. You're saved through repentance and living uh, and having a changed heart in Christ. And then as Christians, we're predestined to be adopted into this inheritance. So it leads us to thought, too, this, that God adopted us. Now, in the Roman world, it was a difficult to adopt a child. And I would say in the modern world, it's still pretty difficult, pretty costly to adopt a child. But as a Roman dad, you could have your son disposed of. You could get rid of your son. Um, you could have your son killed. But if you had adopted a child... Well, then that was a whole other story. You couldn't disown that child. And so what's Paul saying? He's saying that we're secure in Christ. That when we, when we are adopted, God's not going to disown you. He's not going to wake up one day and say, you know what? That really bad thing that you did last weekend, I'm done with you. No, no, no. When we're in Christ, when we're adopted, we are secure. Verse 5, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. How are we adopted? Only through what Christ did on the cross. There is no other way in which man can be saved than through the name of Jesus Christ. And so we see God's grace and character shining through this passage. Verse, uh, verses 5 and 6. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace which he has blessed us in the beloved. And so Paul also says that God the Father blesses us. Now what does he bless us with? Well, he blesses us with his glory, his grace, his mercy, his forgiveness. God loves us not because we can earn it or because of who we are, but because of who he is. The Bible says that God is love. 
And he does all this through his beloved son, Jesus Christ. And so he says, you are rich. The Father has richly blessed you. He's chosen you. He's adopted you. He's blessed you. Moving on, what about riches from the Son? says this, and guys, I have the, I'm going to do something with my phone because, Devin, would you grab this? Because it's chattering and talking. And if you're wondering why it's chattering and talking, it's because we have a security team and I'm on that channel and somehow it's, it's coming through. So I didn't want my, my pockets to keep talking while I was preaching. We want God's word to keep talking while I'm preaching. So let's look at this. Let's look at riches from the sun. It says in verse 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So Jesus the Son redeems us. Now again, I told you these first few, first few chapters are a little more theological, so I want to work through, through this together. It says that Jesus redeems us. What does it mean to redeem? It means to purchase and set free by paying a price. To purchase and set free by paying a price. Now, in the Roman Empire at the time, slaves outnumbered freed men three to one. And so slavery was incredibly common, but a man could buy a slave, um, pay the price for that, and give him his freedom. That's exactly what Christ did for us. He bought us, what did he buy us with? The most precious payment that could be his precious blood as he died on Christ. So he bought us and he freed us from slavery, freed us from uh, slavery to sin and sorrow and death through the price of his blood. So he redeems us. What else does it say? It says that the Son forgives us. Every single sin, your deepest and worst regret, things that you would be ashamed to tell anybody, perhaps things you have never told anybody that you've carried with you that you still feel shame over. Let me tell you what, Jesus came to remove our shame and to remove our guilt. He forgives us. How does he do that? According to the riches of his grace. Christian, if you're in Christ, if you've experienced his love and forgiveness and his grace, Paul says, you are rich. Also, verse 8, notice this, that the Son shows us God's plan. It says, Which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Paul says, Through Christ, the mystery of God's will has been made known. What is this mystery? What is God's will? It was in the fullness of time, when it was just the right time, Christ entered the world. Why is that? That we might have the truth and that we might experience forgiveness and know the Lord. And he encourages us in this, that one day all things will be united in Christ. Ever since sin entered the world, things have been falling apart. And maybe you look around and you see this. You look around and you say, you know what? Why are things bad? Why is the world evil? Why do bad things happen? It's because sin entered the world, and ever since then, things have been falling apart. Man was separated from God. Man was also separated from man. That's why we have divisions, and we, we, we fight one another, and there's problems between one another. Sin tears everything apart. But in Christ, God is putting everything back together. The curse of Eden will one day be reversed as all things are united in Christ. Verse 11, the Son has also made us an inheritance. Look at verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. So in Christ we have an inheritance, and we are also an inheritance in Christ, because we have value in Christ. He paid the price to purchase us. The church is his bride, and so we are Christ's inheritance. And so the Son redeems us, he forgives us, he shows us God's plan, and he's made us an inheritance. Now last, let's look together at these riches from the Holy Spirit, and then we'll close out together. Look at verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. So salvation is a message to believe, and it's a person to trust. It's God's word given to us, and we accept the truthfulness of that word, 
but we also accept and we welcome the person of Jesus Christ into our lives. When we accept Christ and his words, we see, Paul says, that we are sealed by the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit seals us. And you see in verse 13 how a sinner, which were all sinners, becomes a saint. That is to say, a believer. Look at verse 13 again. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Spirit. So Paul says the steps of salvation is a sinner hears the gospel. Before you can come to know Christ, you have to know that you're a sinner, that Christ came and he died on the cross for your sins, that if you ask God to forgive you, you repent, you turn from your ways, you place your trust in Christ. It's a free gift, not anything you can do on your own. The Bible says you hear that and you believe, not just believe that God exists, but believe and trust in the person of Christ and what he did. It says you'll be saved and you are sealed with the Spirit. When we come to Christ, He gives us His Spirit. Think of this sealing as a finalized transaction. It means we are in Christ, we know the Lord, it's final. We are owned, we are owned by the Lord Jesus Christ. We bear the seal of God. Read verse 13 again. In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in Him, were sealed by the promise of His Spirit. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? We also see that the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He guarantees our inheritance. That is to say, he locks it is. Your inheritance, Christian, is going nowhere. We have riches from God now. We're experiencing these now. But also, we're reminded that there is more to come. God will finish the work he started. All things will be united in Christ and we'll spend eternity with him. And we'll see our inheritance realized in full. What an amazing day that's going to be. And so, Christian, this morning, in conclusion, I want to remind you this. No more sandwiches, believers. We are rich in Christ. He has given us an abundant inheritance. And I want you to be reminded of this, that true riches come from the Lord. You know, it's so easy to get caught up in this material world because there's so many amazing things that please the eye, so many things that God created, let me remind you, for his glory, but also for your enjoyment because we are his children and he loves us in the same way that I like my kids to enjoy themselves. I believe that God loves us and he wants to see us enjoy ourselves as well. But don't become so caught up in the material world that we forget about the abundant riches found in Christ. Also, I'd remind you of this as we close out, that all of our wealth comes by God's grace for God's glory, that you can't earn it, but isn't it good? Isn't God good to us and we should give him glory for all that he brings into our lives? And I remind you of this, Christian, as well, that there is more to come. The riches we have now pale in comparison to what's coming, and so I think we should be reminded of this, you know, some weeks you have a week where everything is great and glorious and you think, you know what, I am on top of the world. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Then you have those weeks where difficulty comes, tragedy strikes, or maybe you're just in a funk for no reason and you really don't know why. I want to remind you of a, another verse that the Apostle Paul penned. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Now remember, Paul's writing to the Ephesians from prison, but the same man that writes to the Ephesians from prison penned this verse. Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 4, 17. Paul says this. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. What's Paul saying? He's saying, yeah, I know things are hard right now, but it pales in comparison to the inheritance you have coming. So let me ask you, Christian, this morning. I want you to look deep within yourself. Be honest. Do you have an inheritance? Have you come to that moment in your life where you know that you know that you know you have a relationship with Christ? Not just to be baptized. There's plenty of people baptized that don't know the Lord. But have you trusted and repented? And do you stand in good standing with the Lord? Not based on your works, but based on the works of Christ. Do you truly know Christ? Or maybe this morning you're in a place or you know Christ, but just like the, those millionaires who died of malnutrition, you're forgetting that you have this abundant wealth in Christ. 
maybe it's time to stop looking at what's immediately around us and reorient our focus and say, you know what, I've been really distracted, God, by what's going on in the world or by shortcomings and sins in my lives or just by struggles that I have. And God says, Christian, rest in the fact that you're wealthy and rich. Every blessing I can give you, I've given you. This morning, if you need to speak with somebody or talk, this room is always open for prayer. Somebody to talk with you in church, I'm always happy to speak with you. I know you tell you, I tell you this every week, but I want you to know that you're loved, that you're cared for, and that there's always somebody that wants to spend time with you if you have a burden on your heart. Let's bow together as we sing this morning. Heavenly Father, we come before you today thanking you for allowing us to be in this assembly, Lord, in this, in this, this building, this facility as the church comes together. Lord, we thank you for your abundant riches in our lives, Lord. Riches that sometimes we even just don't even realize we forget about. And Lord, I know it's so easy to, to minimize our sins and to think, you know what, I don't do this and I don't do that. I'm, I'm, I'm mostly okay, but Lord, remind us that we're not okay. That even in trying to do good sometimes, Lord, I do wrong. That my heart is bent toward evil and destruction. Lord, change my heart. Create in me a new heart, Lord. Lord, I pray if there's anybody here that's wrestling with coming to you. Maybe, Lord, there's even somebody here that's been sitting in church for years and years and years, but you have given them the awareness. You have drawn their heart to the place where they know, Lord, they haven't placed their trust in you. Lord, I pray if that's anyone this morning, that they would come to know you, that they would forget about what people might say, because whenever somebody comes to Christ, Lord, that's cause for rejoicing and fellowship. So I pray that you would take any fear away from them and remind them that nothing else compares to the inheritance we have in you. Lord, help us to serve you and live for you as we go throughout this week. All these things we pray in your name. Amen.
an opportunity to honor the Lord this week. Be an encourager to someone around you. God bless you. We will see you guys next week.